Good evening, good evening. We thank you for joining us for our online worship services. And let's just give the Lord a chance to praise. Let's just begin to praise Him for who He is and what He's done. If God, the Lord has done anything good for you in the last week, in the last 24 hours, in the last five minutes, in the last three seconds, you need to be giving Him a mighty hand clap of praise and a hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, because He didn't have to do it. Amen. He woke us up this morning in our right mind the articulation of our speech and the use of our lambs hallelujah he's such a good god and so we invite you to join us in praise and worship as we usher in the spirit of god because if there's one thing that we know about our worshiping god it's that we are free to be free worshipers of him amen Come on, let's stay in that spirit right there. If you're free, say, I'm free. I'm free. Take a little song that declares I'm a free worshiper. Ty, come on. my hands and worship, Lord, I'm free, Lord, I'm free, yes, Jesus, free to dance and sing, I'm free to lift my hand and worship, Lord, I hear you say, say I'm
Hey, come on, come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord right where you are. Hallelujah. Y'all heard the song. We are free to dance, free to sing, free to lift our hands and worship to the one true king. Hallelujah. If you have given your life to Christ and accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you ought to thank God that you're free and that you'll never be bound again. Amen. And with that, we welcome you and we thank you for joining us for this our Tuesday and Wednesday evening worship. We give all glory to God for what he is doing through this, his global church body. Let us pray. Father God, we just come thanking you right now, Father God, for your presence. Thanking you for your grace, how you protected us this day, Father God. You woke us up in our right minds with the articulation of our speech and the use of our limbs, and you got us through the day, Father God. And you've brought us to a place, Father God, where we can now exalt you lift you up, and learn a word from your word, Father God. And so we thank you for the provision that you have given us this day, Father God. Thank you for being there for us, Father God. And we praise you for sending the Holy Spirit to guide us and watch over us this and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as always, we want to spend, uh, uh, send a special hello and thank you for joining us as well as a special hello and welcome <laughs> to our sister church, Oasis on the Mount in Garland, Texas, led by my brother, Pastor Christopher Pipkin. He delivered an awesome word this last past Sunday. We encourage you to follow them on Facebook because that's how you get to see them. Just go to Facebook and put Oasis on the Mount in that search box and follow everything that they're doing. They're doing some amazing things for the Lord and we are Always so grateful for our fellow saints at Oasis on the Mount Church and Healing Center, who we love very much. Amen. And we want to start off this evening as we normally do with a couple of quick announcements. First, hit that invite button. Invite somebody out to service with us this evening. Tell them that we have pretty much an express service. You know, it really is a shame some Pastor Pipkin spoke about this Sunday. Really is a shame that I have to say, oh, it's an express service. It's less than an hour, even though it is. But we devote three hours to a football game, as he said, two to a basketball game. You devote two hours to a movie. Sometimes you devote a whole hour to a TV show that you like. We can't stop and give the Lord an hour of our time to praise him and worship him for all the good that he's done for us. I'm just saying, invite somebody out to worship with us this evening. We have praise and worship. We have altar call. We have the word. We have giving. We have the full gamut of a full church service that you would experience if you were in the building. It's just done virtually. So hit that invite button and invite somebody out. Secondly, we also want you to um, check out our television show called Walking the Word with Benevolent Faith Ministries, which airs every Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. Central, 11.30 a.m. Pacific Time on the Daily Gospel Network. And so you can catch us on Roku, on Apple TV, and on Amazon Fire TV, or you can just watch it online by going to www.dailygospelnetwork.tv and catch it there. Our first episode of the year airs this coming Wednesday, which is tomorrow, March 17th. So we can't wait for you to join us there. Amen? But tonight, tonight our scripture passage, my friends, it's taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. And tonight, I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. And the Lord's word reads as follows. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophecy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you. 
and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds and breathe into the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. May the Lord bless the hearing and the reading of his word. Tonight, my friends, I want to speak from the subject, make no bones about it. Make no bones about it. Let us pray. Father God, we just come acknowledging what a privilege it is, Lord God, to bow before your throne of grace and mercy, Lord God. If we had a thousand, a thousand tongues, Lord, it still wouldn't be enough, Father, to praise you and your greatness, Father God. Lord, your word says, behold, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. Lord, these your people, dig your flock, Father God, here at Benevolent Faith Ministries and at Oasis on the Mount Church and Healing Center and at Life Ministries in India. Lord, we've all come together this evening, as well as saints from all around the world, in unity to hear a word from you, Father God, to hear how we, upon reading this text, can know and we should make no bones about it, Father God. Lord, we thank you for your presence here this evening, which we fully anticipate. Because we know your word says, wherever two or more are gathered, there you will be. So we, Father God, thank you for your presence here this evening. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh and new this day. In Jesus' name we pray, let it be hard to say amen, amen, and amen. Make no bones about it. Tonight, friends, as you may have guessed, we're discussing the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel and his many visions. Now, next to the book of Revelation, Ezekiel is probably the weirdest and most dramatic book of the Hebrew Bible. Because of how it combines far out visions, judgments of violent destruction and death, and predictions of peace and consolation all into one tantalizing tale. It's like a crazy movie. Now, Ezekiel was a really intense visionary, I meaning he had a lot of visions. And he would go into these trances and start exhibiting behavior that was so bizarre that many people thought he was psychotic or just hallucinating. Even ancient scholars who assembled the final form of the Hebrew Bible, a Hebrew Bible, they almost didn't include 
the book of Ezekiel. Because it was just considered too strange and troubling to be included. It also contradicted some of the rules of Leviticus, but we'll get into that some other time. But eventually they thought it was worth worthy of being put in the canon, so they put it in there. But the particular passage that we're discussing this evening, which is chapter 37, verses 1 through 14 that we just read, is known as the vision of the valley of the dry bones. And it's a very familiar and well-known passage of scripture. Hence the title of this message. Make no bones about it. See, there's a dual meaning with that. The phrase make no bones about it means to state a fact in a way that leaves no doubt or creates objection to it. And in that regard, our message in today's text will quote state facts in a way that leaves no doubt, unquote, about the message that Ezekiel had for Israel back then and which is still applicable to us today. Also, it's a play on words on the subject of the text, which, as we shall see, is metaphorical for the state of the people of Israel who were the subject of this vision, as well as the people in our society today. So, by way of review, because I, you know I like giving y'all context. I'm not just going to drop you in the middle of some text. By way of review, the setting of our text and what has transpired up to this point in the book of Ezekiel, particularly as it pertains to tonight's passage, goes like this. So, like many of the other major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel lived in very turbulent times. And this book is basically about the destruction and exile of the nation of Judah and the promise of its eventual restoration by God. And Ezekiel was like 25 years old at the time that this was done. And he came from a family called Zadok. And this was around 598 BC when he, along with the king and 10,000 other Jews, were taken captives to Babylon. And they were exiled there after the first siege of Judah by the Babylonians. So God appears... And gives Ezekiel his message, predicting the fall of Judah and Jerusalem in the most violent imagery possible. See, it's interesting for us to note that Ezekiel's name means, quote, strengthened by God. That's what Ezekiel means. And there's little doubt that the visions that he was given during his 20 plus years of faithful ministry were used to challenge and strengthen his fellow exiles. So Ezekiel gets this vision from God and proceeds to warn all the exiles about the coming destruction that God has told him about. And he makes it clear that this is punishment for their, their idolatry and all the other disgusting behavior that they had. And so he has this vision where he sees God's presence leaving the temple in Jerusalem to instead go hang out with the exiles in Babylon. And God also orders Ezekiel to do strange things that today somebody might consider like performance art. Like he has to lie motionless for the same number of days as the number of years that Israel and Judah would be exiled, for example. So he was getting his Old Testament David Blaine on, if you will. Okay. Now, eventually, Ezekiel gets a message from God that Jerusalem actually did fall. But at that time, God promises that he'll restore his people to their land and live with them in peace forever. And that they'll get their country back and be ruled by David or a descendant of the line of David. And no longer prisoners to their sins. Namely, again, idolatry and immorality because that's what they got punished for in the first place. And then the book ends with God showing Ezekiel how the temple will be rebuilt and tells them how the land will be distributed among the different tribes of Israel and confirming how God's presence will return to Jerusalem. Now, that's an extremely generic summarization of the book of Ezekiel, but it gives you the context, the backdrop for our story, as well as where we are in tonight's passage of scripture. But what we can see is that the ministry of Ezekiel was marked by a series of visions. 
including the one that's the focus of our message tonight. So with that as a backdrop, let's discuss this message, this, uh, this particular passage of scripture, which again is known as the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. And in this vision, as we just read, God sets Ezekiel down in a valley full of dry bones. He asks Ezekiel if these bones can live, and Ezekiel says, I don't know, Lord, only you know that. Right answer. God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones, telling the bones that they'll live, and that the breath of God will enter them, causing them to put on sinews, which is tendon, uh, tendons and ligaments and muscle, and flesh again. So Ezekiel does that, and the bones all rattle together, <laughs> forming skeletons. And then they have flesh and muscle grow on them, forming complete human bodies, but they're still not alive with no divine breath in them. They're just bodies laying around at that point. So then God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the, for the breath to enter the bodies. And when Ezekiel does so, they all come alive. And God explains that these are the bones of the house of Israel, of the people of Israel. And that even though the people believe that their fate is sealed and that there'll be no restoration of their kingdom and their land, the truth is there will be. And that is the meaning of the bones coming to life. So, based on our review of the text, there are actually three things that Ezekiel experiences that I want us to pay attention to this evening, y'all. Just three and I'm done. Because as believers today, we can relate to all three things within our own experiences. So from the text, we're going to see that Ezekiel experienced, number one, a shocking revelation. Number two, a serious responsibility. And then number three, a supernatural resurrection. So it was a shocking revelation, a serious responsibility, and a supernatural resurrection. A resurrection. So first, we see a shocking revelation. And you can follow along with me, with me right in the text, verses 1 through 3. I'm coming right out of the text, y'all. See, if we're going to sense the great need that the world around us has to hear the gospel then we have to have a clear grasp of the condition in which the world finds itself. The vision Ezekiel saw was a valley full of dry, scattered bones. And it depicted the desolation, the destitution, and the devastation of Israel. And until we have a similar vision of the world in which we live, y'all, we're not going to be stirred to action. We got to see it how he saw it. We need to see what he saw when he looked out over that valley of dry bones. It's the same vision we need today as we look out over a lost and dead world. In verse 1, the bones speak of death. So they represent. Since so many bones were in one place, it may be that Ezekiel saw the aftermath of a great battle. If so, that would have been insulting to him as a Jewish man. You're like, why is that, Reb? Because one of the worst insults that a Jew could suffer was to be denied a proper burial. So here's a valley filled with bones of the dead who had probably been defeated by their enemies and left to rot where they fell. It was a vision of death on a massive scale. Saints of God, what do you see when you look at the world around us? Because all, all the people around us may be living out their lives, working their jobs, enjoying their hobbies, raising their families, while they may be charming people or intellectual people or reasonable people or even physically fit people. If they don't know Jesus Christ, then they're spiritually dead. Period. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul tells us that until the Holy Spirit quickens men and women to spiritual life, they are, quote, dead in trespasses and in sins. Right from the word of God. 
So that could be true of your wife or your husband, your parents, your children, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, basically anybody. While they may be full of life physically, if they don't know Jesus, they're dead spiritually. Period. We should pray, y'all, and ask God to open our eyes. To open our eyes and to help us see the world around us as it really is. Now, verse 2 talks about the level of devastation that Ezekiel saw. The bones Ezekiel saw were, quote, very dry. Because they had been on that valley floor under the merciless heat of the sun until they were sapped of all moisture. If you've ever sat out somewhere at a parade, at a concert, under a constant beating sun with no shade, you know how you felt. Now imagine those bones being out there. Wasn't no more moisture left on the bones. They were sat dry and likely brittle, ready to break. In that dead, dry condition, them bones wasn't fit for nothing but to be gathered and buried because they had become absolutely useless. And we need to recognize that this is the very condition of the lost souls of the world who live all around us. Look at how Romans chapter 3 verse 12 puts it. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. The word worthless here in Romans 3.12 is translated as being useless. And this verse reminds us that the law sinner is useless to God, just like them dry bones. They're unprofitable in the sense that God can't use them for his glory. Again, we should be asking the Lord to open our eyes and help us to see the devastation in the world all around us. The lost are trapped in a literal sin crisis. And they can't escape. They're spiritually dead and devastated by their sins. Until we understand where they are, we won't be moved to reach them with the gospel. So we've looked at these Ezekiel's shocking revelation. Next, let's look at the sincere responsibility. And this is in verses 4 through 9. Again, follow along with me, y'all. You can follow along right in our notes uh, section or in the Bible section. Just click on either one of those. I'm right out of the text. As Ezekiel looked over that valley of dry bones, God spoke to him and told him what to do. This is the sincere responsibility. God showed Ezekiel that he had a personal responsibility to that valley of dead dry bones. And if we look closely at this text, we can see that the same responsibility that rested on Ezekiel's shoulders then rests on our shoulders today. Same one. In verse 9, God essentially commands Ezekiel to preach. Look at verse 9. Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel was commanded to preach to a valley filled with skeletons, y'all. And if we truly think about that, almost nothing can be more foolish or ridiculous than to start preaching to a bunch of dry bones. Ezekiel was probably thinking, what is this, the Church of Latter-day Skeletons? <laughs> and anybody who sees the true condition of this lost world can understand Ezekiel's response. Because humanly speaking, what's harder than trying to confront a world filled with lifeless, useless, and hopeless men and women with the word of the gospel? What's worse? Your family members, you try to preach the gospel to them or try to witness to them. Eh, go on with somewhere with all that church stuff, all that God stuff. I'm trying to watch the game. They're dead. It's like you talking to dry, dead bones in the valley, just like him. You see the uselessness in it. And yet, this is the clear obligation of the church. It's what we're supposed to do, y'all. God has not promised 
to bless our theological systems. He hasn't promised to bless our shallow and insincere interpretations of his word. And he hasn't promised to bless our philosophical speculations about what his word means. But he has committed himself to bless the preaching of the unadulterated word of God. Look at how Isaiah put it, Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And only through that type of preaching will there be, quote, a noise, a shaking, bones coming together, bone to bone, which is what the text said. That's what we see in verse 7. Only the word of God can produce them type of miracles. Because as the apostle Paul put it in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Friends, a lost world doesn't need to hear about our church. Ooh, our church is popping. They don't need to hear about that. They don't need to hear about our denomination. They don't need to hear about how dynamic our preachers are. Ooh, child, he preached the word. They don't need to hear about how fire our praise and worship team is. Ooh, they was jamming today. No. And they definitely don't need to hear our opinions about the word of God. No, they need to hear the gospel of grace. They need to hear the truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save sinners and that he rose again from the dead to save everyone who will come to him. They need to hear that there is hope and love and life and salvation in Jesus Christ. They need to hear about him and it is our responsibility to tell them. Look at how the Apostle Mark puts it. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. That's our commandment, y'all. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Also, real quick, note how verse 9 discusses, quote, the four winds. And that represents the four corners of the earth, meaning where we are commanded to take the gospel of Christ to the four corners of the earth, everywhere. You know, we praise God for life ministries and my brother, Pastor Shelton Robbie. Do you know they go into remote jungle areas where there's lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and preach the gospel to people who have never heard of Christ. And you're like, huh? Never. He's preaching the gospel to people who worship stones still in 2021. They worship rocks. They worship snakes. They practice witchcraft. They practice head hunting. True fact. This is our brother, our sister church in India. He's out there in the world doing what this text says. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Remember, Jesus said he's not coming back until the whole world is reached with the gospel. We praise God for life ministries and the work that they're doing. So we looked at Ezekiel's shocking revelation and his sincere responsibility. Last one and I'm done, y'all. Let's look at a supernatural resurrection. The supernatural resurrection. And we see that in verses 10 through 14. Y'all see how we walk through the whole, the whole text? From verse 1 to verse 14, we walk through the whole text. A supernatural resurrection. Now, in response to the preaching and the praying of Ezekiel, the Lord moves in power. And several amazing things take place when God brings the dead bones to life. And we cannot miss the significance of this for us today as believers. Don't miss it. First, look at verse 10. Note how it says the bones were, quote, activated. The text says, well, actually the text says that they, quote, they lived. In other words, the corpses, the dead bodies, because remember they were bones first, 
Then they got muscle and skin on them, but they didn't have life breathed into them. Then he breathed life into them, and they lived. And the corpses were animated, vitalized, and brought back to life. Ezekiel was watching this. He was probably astonished. He saw a valley filled with the dead literally come back to life. Back to life. They got their soul to soul on. Okay? Say to God, the same thing can happen today as we share the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. Look how the Apostle John put it in John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a member of the Jewish high court called the Sahadrim. But he was impressed by Jesus' teachings and wanted to learn more. So he snuck out at night to see Jesus after dark because he ain't want his reputation with the other Jewish leaders to be damaged if he was seen. Because remember, they hated Jesus, okay? Wanted to kill him and eventually did. So Nicodemus goes to Jesus and finds out about being born again in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Remember, that's John chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. But what Nicodemus discovered was that even a good religious man like himself was blind to sin. The text said that he, quote, could not see the kingdom of God. And that he was bound to sin because the text says that he, quote, could not enter the kingdom of God. And that he was born in sin. And the text says that he, quote, could not inherit the kingdom of God until he was quickened to life or born again. The new birth is a supernatural event, a time when God raises those who were spiritually dead to a new life in Christ Jesus. It's just as amazing to see and witness in others as this vision that Ezekiel saw. Y'all like, what you mean? You don't think that when a drug addict gets clean and turns his life over to Christ and then becomes a drug counselor and helps other people get clean? Or a gang member who is out there doing mad dirt gives his life to Christ and then turns his life around and becomes a gang counselor? That's a new birth. Are they not brought back to life from their previously dead states and born again into new lives in Christ? It's the same thing as what Ezekiel saw. It's the same thing, y'all. So we need to be considering the lessons that the contemporary church, that's us, the church today, can learn from what transpires in verse 10. Look at verse 10. In particular, look at how the bones were associated. Y'all like, what you mean, man? Note that verse 10 says that they are transformed into, quote, an exceedingly great army. Don't miss it. In other words, one moment, their dead bones fill in the valley. And the next, they're a mighty living army ready for the Lord's use. Remember, we said that people who don't are spiritually dead and who don't know Christ, they're worthless to the Lord. He can't use them. But when they're brought back to life, now they're ready for the Lord's use. And only the work of the Holy Spirit can bring individual units into a whole like that. Just like an army. Look at how 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13 puts it. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. God brings his people out of the deadness of sin into a new life in Christ Jesus. He saves them, gives them spiritual gifts, and then places them in a local church where they can work aside other resurrected sinners all for the glory of God. The church is God's great army. And in this instance, note how in we're... In the, note how in the text, it says that they're the great army. That's us today. The bones came to life and were like a great army. We're like that today when we're born again 
in Christ. Note how in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, we are commanded to, quote, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Also, take note of how he, quote, breathed life into them. That's what Christ does for the spiritually dead. He breathed no life into them. Look at verse 14. It has a similar lesson for the contemporary church because it shows the assurance that is granted to the church. Look at verse 14. Look at the first half of it. And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your land. This is a promise to the nation of Israel that they're going to be restored to their land and that they will receive the Lord's blessings again. Then in the second half of verse 14, look at it. He says, then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. God wants Israel to know that what he is about to do is a sovereign work that he's going to do something big in them and through them. All they have to do is believe in him and go with him, and they'll see it come to pass. The same is true for us, the church today. The days of God's blessings are not over. I don't care what the news says about a pandemic and about death and destruction. The days of God's blessings are not over, y'all. God is still the same God that he's always been. He's still working in the supernatural sovereign ways to accomplish his will in the world. Just as he showed Ezekiel, modern day believers simply need to believe in the mechanism that God has put into place to save us. That being salvation in Christ. All we have to do is believe in Christ and all the promises of God will come to pass through that faith, through that faith. Same way they, he promised to Israel they would come to pass. It's the same for us. But part of that involves our seeking God and asking him to give us a vision of the lost as they really are. And to fill us with his spirit so that we can most effectively be sent out into the world to tell the lost about Jesus Christ. Can't witness to your family and your loved ones if you don't acknowledge and recognize the state that they're already in. Dead, dry bones. Then, with the power of Christ behind us and working through us and in us, we can help raise them to a new life by witnessing to them and tell them about the gospel. Hallelujah. So as I close tonight, my friends, we need to be asking ourselves, so what exactly is the lesson for us in this passage of scripture? Well, as I just said, when we look at our world today, our loved ones, our friends, when we look at the state of the world, people we don't know, nations around the world, it's easy to become angry and disheartened by the things that we see people do and the things that we hear people say. Y'all need to pray for me because when I go out in public and I see people without wearing a mask, I feel some type of way about it and I shouldn't, but I do. So y'all pray for me. People are living foul and trifling, y'all. And worse yet, they're more openly showing hatred that they have for God and the gospel and the church. You see that more than ever. They mock it on TV. They make fun of our beliefs. They make fun of us. They call us dumb for believing in fairy tales, for believing in made up stories. But think about it, y'all. If it wasn't for the grace of God, those people would be us. For some people, that was us before the grace of God delivered us. But 
Somebody, maybe it was Big Mama. Maybe it was your own mama. Somebody cared enough to pray for us and to tell us about the salvation that we can have in Jesus. The least we can do is ask the Lord to give us the same compassion towards others that was shown to us. That's why I tell y'all to pray for me, please. So I don't feel some type of way when I see somebody without a mask. That I would instead have compassion for them. Because that, my friends, is how the bones come to life. Like Ezekiel, we need to witness to tell everybody and to pray for them. Tell them about the gospel and pray for them and with them. And then let God draw them to Jesus. You're never going to do that. Only the Holy Spirit can change somebody's heart. You can't do that. And only God knows when they're actually ready for that. Your job is to sow the ground. You know how a farmer sows the ground and he plants the seed? Sow the ground and plant the seed. And let God give the increase. And in the process, may we always remember God's greatness cannot be grounded by the graveyard. Make no bones about it. Amen? But you can't witness to the world about God's ability to take them out of the graveyard if you haven't accepted the new life that is available to you. Through faith and obedience in his son, Christ, our Lord and Savior. So we invite you to get to know Jesus today, y'all. If you were in the church, this is the virtual version of an altar call. Where the pastor says, come on down to the altar and give your life to the Lord. This is the virtual version of that. We have folks standing by right now. If you hit that button that says raise hand, they're going to be ready to speak with you about what it means to follow Christ. And what your next steps are after you've confessed him as your Lord and Savior and accepted him in your heart. They're going to be right there to help counsel you about the next steps. Aren't you tired of running? I say it every week because every week is true. Somebody out there is still tired of running. They've been running all week. Running from their problems. Running from their fears. Running from their worries. Running from their anxiety. Running from their spiritually dead states. Ain't you tired of being dry bones? Don't you want to live a new life? Have God resurrect you from the spiritually dead state that you're in? Then come to Jesus. He's waiting for you. He is ready and willing to take you in. To be your friend. To do everything necessary. That he would have a relationship with you and you with him. So that he can reconcile you back to God. Remember, scripture tells us that without Christ, we're enemies of the Lord. Enemies. You don't want God as your enemy, do you? That's one divine being that you don't want that smoke with. Okay? So won't you come to Jesus today? He is waiting for you. That's what that nagging feeling is. You've been wondering, why do I feel like this? What is it? It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit knocking on the door of your heart. We said it before, people can't change hearts. People can't change the way other people are. Only God can do that. And when you get that feeling like, man, something got to change, that's when you're ready because that's the Holy Spirit telling you, it's time. Now is the time. Won't you come? Is there one? Bless God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People always ask, why do you clap at that point? Because we know that even if someone didn't come forward tonight, the seed has been planted. Remember, all we do is sow and plant the seed. God gives the increase. So if they didn't come forward tonight, maybe they'll come forward next time. Maybe after this message, they'll go and speak to someone that they trust about the Bible, that they trust in the church so that they can say, what must I do to be saved? Because remember, we have a duty to see those dry 
bones live. Amen. And with that, it's time for giving. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Now, y'all might be thinking, why are we clapping right now? Because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And like, unlike most churches, when Upland Faith Ministries is not after your money, we have an entirely different model. Well, first, you might be wondering why I'm standing by this uprooted tree. Well, the symbolism shouldn't be lost on us. When Christ found us, he uprooted us out of sin and brought us into his marvelous light. And in doing so, we are commissioned to walk like him. And that means to support the causes that he thought were most important. And that's what our giving partnership model is all about. At Benevolent Faith Ministries, we don't collect tithes and offerings from our membership. Uh-uh. Instead, we engage in what is called giving partnerships. Now, what is that? Click on that link that says give or go to our website at benevolentfaithministries.org and click on the giving link. And what's going to happen is that it's going to bring up a list of organizations with which we've already partnered in ministry that are doing the work of the Lord around the globe. Organizations like Compassion International, Prison Fellowship, uh, St. Jude's, American Cancer Society, Feeding America, and our newest giving partner, which is Life Ministries in Southern India with our brother, Pastor Shelton Ravi, doing some incredible work in the remote jungles and the areas of India. All of these organizations are already doing the work of Christ all around the world, and we are just coming into partnership with them. So much like this uprooted tree, we've been uprooted from our past states, and we are previously living like the tree was, but now we have uprooted ourselves and live in the glory of Christ, and therefore we support what he wants us to support. Remember, Christ said that the way in the book of Matthew, the way that we treat the least of society is a reflection of how we treat him. Let us not be like these uprooted trees and just die. Instead, we want to come into life with our uprooting. And we want to give to those causes that are so important to him. So make sure that you hit that give button. And at this time, we thank you for everybody that supports our model. And we want to pray blessings over your tithes and offerings to our giving model. Father God, we come just thanking you, Lord, for being the resurrection in the life, Father God, for resurrecting us, Father God, for uprooting us out of a life of sin, out of a former life of debauchery, Father God, out of a former life that we could not come in your presence and instead rerooting us, Father God, in solid ground, solid ground based on you, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, for everybody that gives to our giving model. We ask you to bless their offerings today. May it return 10, 100, 1,000 fold for the edification of the kingdom and for your glory, Father God. Bless those who have given. Lord, bless those who wanted to give but are not in a position to give. May they be in a position to give next time, Father God. And we thank you for it. We thank you for allowing us to be a platform that allows people to come forth and give to your causes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are so grateful and thankful to everybody that supports our cause. Remember, we're rooted in the Lord. And so because we are, we need to make sure that we're giving to all of his causes. And that's what our giving partnership model is all about. Amen. And with that, we're done, my friends. Now prepare your heart to receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. May the grace of God, which is manifest through the blood shed by his son Jesus, guide you in all truth, that you may be committed to the precepts of Christ Jesus as your Lord, even as you attempt to walk in courage and in power along the path that he's already prepared for you, such that he guides your steps and fully equips and prepares you to represent his kingdom properly all around the globe. In Jesus' name we pray, let every heart say amen, amen, and amen. Hey, thanks for joining us, and God willing, we'll catch you next week.